Good morning and welcome to the next in the series of my BPF webinars. This morning we're discussing planning for recovery. My name is Ghislaine Halpenny and I'm the Director of Strategy and External Affairs here at the BPF, although evidently not at the BPF, in my bedroom at home, very much hoping that two small children stay in the park and it doesn't rain, otherwise we shall be interrupted. Um, on the panel today we have Simon Gallagher, Director of Planning at MHCLG, we have Michael Meadows, Head of Planning at British Land, Alice Lester, Operational Head of Regeneration, Growth and Employment at London Borough of Brent, and Elva Phelan, Director at Wood. I'd like to invite our audience to try and post some questions, tech allowing, and I will try and group them together and weave them into the discussion as we go forward for the next hour. To start us off, Simon, I wondered if you could say a few words about what you've been doing at MHCLG recently, ensuring that the planning system can, can keep going and that we can continue to deliver as far as possible business as usual. Hello, it's Simon Gallagher here. I am the Director of Planning at MHCLG. Sorry, I am broadcasting from deep in dark South London and I thought uh, my internet collection was falling apart there, so I missed some of Gislaine's uh, introduction. <laughs> Um, but uh, good, good to be online this uh, this morning and thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, I just want to do a little bit about what we've been doing in MHCLG and what we've, what we've still got to do. Um, I think the core message and the key starting point for, uh, for, the, for this is that um, once the new measures were introduced on social distancing, it was quite clear that planning activity across um, England had um, really ground to a halt in lots of areas. Um, construction on the actual building sites had ground to a halt and we heard uh, had an instant question of what to do and what to respond to that. Our ministers are being are being absolutely clear with us that the priority is to get that planning service up and running, to get the continuity of business, to get um, decisions continuing to flow and to get the economy moving again. Um, and so notwithstanding the support the local authorities are doing and they're doing absolutely heroic work and Alex may want to talk about some of this a bit later to provide frontline response to the current crisis um, real priority in getting those planning decisions moving again we spent a lot of time over the last month listening to industry and different parts of the industry and their different requirements uh, and we've been very grateful for the honest and real-time feedback we've had from so many and I suspect some of you on the phone have been participants in the, that process um, what we've been doing, there are four things um, that we have done so far, but not the job is not done. Firstly, is been about enabling planning committees to meet and to carry on decision making. We've passed laws that permit that. Um, we think, based on some uh, scanning uh, last week, that about th a third of local authorities have either already had their planning committees meet or have got a scheduled date in the diary for them to do so uh, through um, through the current month. Um, the planning advisory service are doing some great work uh, on best practice on that. There's more to do to carry on that, implementing that to get more and more places to implement that. But I think there's some really good work going on there across local government. There's going to be a lot of learning on this. There's going to be a lot of um, experiences of which ones have worked well and which ones have worked less well. I think that is inevitable in this. It's really quite good modernisation anyway. And local authorities are doing some really great work on that. Um, the second thing we've done is introduce a few permitted development rights um, in order to get um, uh, some of the important decisions moving as soon as possible. That includes on um, uh, support to the National Health Service so that it doesn't have to get filing permissions for temporary development. That's been a really important thing which has taken cost and time out of the NHS process and that's been a big priority for us. Um, the third thing, and this was one of the first things we did, was just encourage a degree of pragmatism about operating enforcement activity at the moment. I think there are things that businesses that um, that local authorities need to do at this time, which just demand a little bit of common sense and pragmatism in there. And we're really encouraging that at the moment. And then the final thing we have been doing is getting the inspectorate, the planning inspectorate, geared up to work remotely. That is not yet complete, but I hope you've started to see that the first decisions and the first dates for hearings are now uh, scheduled and um, they are making progress. I think there's more, more work to do and the inspectorate are testing that out. These are big and complex processes and there's more work to do to establish exactly how those are, uh, are working. Um, 
we are not yet done on our immediate response. I think there are some still some very practical issues we've been hearing both from local government and from uh, from the development industry about things like um, site notices, consultation. How do we get the, those working through? And we're on, we're on it on those. We understand those questions, uh, and those need to be sorted to enable us to get decision making moving. Some local authorities are finding some deeply practical ways of doing those, and there's some really good ways of sharing that across the. Um, across the, uh, the, uh, the country. I think our thoughts are now turning increasingly towards the next stage. Um, <coughs> as those of you who've been spotting the market are talking about getting back on site very soon. Um, you'll have seen some announcements from them and we're thinking about what we need to do to support that. I think there are three issues that from my listening that have really flown top towards me. The first one is the question of planning permissions uh, that are due to expire soon. I know there have been a lot in the, uh, the development industry who've made that point to us that there, there are some permissions that are due to expire soon. Um, and which we need to which need to be extended or else they'll just have to go back through the process um, not easy to fix not easy um, for a number of uh, quite boring and practical reasons but those are issues that we want to uh, be, we're aware of and we're trying to find some solutions to that and we're very uh, very conscious of that um, we've also heard a number of representations about how the community infrastructure levy, it works in particular at the moment. Um, we are seeing some local authorities offer a little flexibility um, and we are uh, about some immediate payments. We're picking up some stories uh, of some problems. It seems to be different in different places, not quite clear what, what, the, uh, what the answers are in some of those areas, but we're definitely aware of that and we know that's, a, that's an issue we've been asked to look at. Um, and the uh, final one is uh, that we've picked up really more over the last sort of three or four days about site hours um, and that developers are thinking pragmatically about how they can get back to work and work safely um, and that that may, may mean that they need to work in slightly different ways on sites and do they need to have some flexibility at the margins to be able to do that and we've heard that from a number of developers over the last week and you'll have seen, seen some of them saying those, those questions I think that's an interesting interesting area to, to work out what uh, what needs to be done on that. Um, I suspect there are going to be other ones, you know, there are sort of issues that um, uh, we are hearing uh, that have been bubbling under. I suspect more issues will emerge as people start to deal with deeply practical issues and sort of keep my please just keep them flowing through to us. We, are, we have finite resources and we will process them as, uh, as, uh, as their relative priority, but I think there will be some other issues that come up and that we are going to need to uh, address. And then just finally, uh, from me, just to remind you that the fact that we are talking about some in instant issues, I think it's providing opportunities for long term, definitely about digital and um, and, uh, and practical processes, but um, it is not the end of the story. And it, it is only seven weeks since we published Planning for the Future, which was a, a serious document which attempted to preface the planning white paper later this year. There is a lot in there, and I'm not gonna go through that or else I'd occupy the whole of this session. But, um, you know, some of the issues, getting plans in everywhere by 2023, really looking at the standard method so it's consistent with our aspirations and uh, and, and works with, alongside the housing delivery test, some new <coughs> development rights for building up and de demolishing and rebuilding, really pushing on uh, design, many more. I think we're trying to flag there some of the territory we want to explore over the year. Uh, and we've also opened up some deliberately, some bigger questions about what sort of planning system we want. Uh, for the uh, for the country, um, precisely when any of this comes together is is, is not um, not something I've resolved at the moment. But I, I want to sort of flag that as a future work program, which I think is going to raise some big issues, which I'm going to want the engagement from this sort of community on. And all that points to is this going to be a big and busy um, 2020 for planning in England. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Simon. I mean, what, what, what a lot there. So, I mean, to, to start from the beginning, rather to start from, from the short term and, and the more immediate. Mike, are there things that are keeping you awake at night that, that you think Simon should be, should be considering now to, to help things move through the system? First thing to say, I'm, I'm on the same um, overloaded South London broadband that Simon is, so hopefully everyone can hear everything that I, I say. 
Um, there are um, lots of things that are keeping me awake um, at night, Ghislaine. Um, how many times am I going to have to read The Hungry Caterpillar today? Um, will, I, will I ever finish that jigsaw story of The Great Wave? Um, the answer to that is almost certainly no. But um, sadly, I don't think Simon can help me with any of those things. Um, so I, I'm focusing on planning and, and stating the obvious, I guess. The, the things that we do... Um, in the short term will have a huge impact um, on the long term. And that was a really useful run through, Simon, and we welcome um, the measures that government's already put in place to keep the system um, moving, and that is having a, a great impact already. Um, but there are big challenges that lie ahead for us. Um, I think for developers that are, are also landlords, um, such as ourselves. Um, we, we are facing um, significantly reduced um, income in the short term. Uh, in, in the March quarter, so April to June rents, we have uh, deferred over £40 million pounds of rents. We have um, cancelled uh, £3 million pounds of rents to small retailers um, and independents, and we've suspended our dividend. Um, and we expect things to be much worse uh, in the June quarter um, so many of those businesses have not been um, trading for for three months, and more sectors will be will be impacted. Um, I think allied to that, we're facing material cost uncertainty um, across the development industry um, due to productivity constraints. We are starting to get back to work, um, but it is very um, limited and essential work on our construction sites maintaining uh, appropriate distancing. Um, there are real constraints on material availability um, and on imports. Uh, we expect there to be constraints on industrial capacity going forward, um, inflationary pressures from, from borrowing um, and potentially labor constraints um, from Brexit as well. Um, so I, I, I guess um, they're all the things that, um, or some of the things that are keeping us up. Um, and what can um, MHCLG do to help? Well, anything that helps cash flow um, in the short term will help businesses like ours. And, and that's important because it incentivizes development by making investment decisions easier. Um, that will support. Thanks, Mike. Uh, ch challenges all round. And the first time I've heard anyone mention Brexit in a long time, it almost feels, <laughs> feels refreshing. At least, at least we yeah. could you know, leave the house and talk about Brexit. So, um, so that's great. Alice, what's keeping you awake at night other than running of a large London borough? Apart from that, well, menopause, could I say that? Possibly, no, it's not that seminar, is it? Um, so I think in terms of practicalities, I, we're doing pretty well at keeping the show on the road, actually. So we've got our you know, system for site notices and consultations and, um, and all of those day-to-day -day things so that there is enough work for all the planners to be doing. They're cracking on writing up decisions and uh, you know, getting them through the system. I suppose the biggest thing in the next week or so that I'm worried about is the virtual planning committee. We've got our first one, which is scheduled for next Wednesday, the 6th of May. It's an agenda of three or four items, but they're quite big. Some of them are locally controversial. So all Already today I've had a complaint, a formal complaint from an objector who says uh, you shouldn't be determining these controversial applications virtually, you need to wait until uh, everyone can get back in the room and objectors can look the committee members in the eye properly etc. Um, we're not going to do that, the government has made it quite clear it expects planning decisions to continue and decisions to be made and we will do that and we have set it up so that objectors are still able to, uh, to address committee. But there are still very big practical issues that we found when we had our planning committee rehearsal, such as just simple things like iPads running out of battery because Zoom is a really big drain on the battery. So if you've got a sort of two hour meeting, I mean, then in the rehearsal, so they had to stop while everyone could recharge their iPads. Most members, they tend to look at the agenda on their iPads when they're in the committee chamber, but they can't now because they're on Zoom. So we've had to go back to printing hard copies and posting them out. So there are all these little practical elements that we've had to think through, but we're gonna, we'll go for it next week as our other local authorities and we'll see how that goes. Personally, I don't think virtual planning committees are something that we'll want to retain when the lockdown is listed. I, I, think, I think you need them in the chamber to have a discussion in front of members of the public. Um, but I, you know, if I'm proved wrong, then fine. But I think, uh, I think, I think that's quite a challenge. Um, 
but looking a bit further ahead, the thing that is worrying me is is the economy. Um, you know, when planning application at the moment, there's planning applications in the pipeline. Uh, there's still work to be done, but it's going to be in a few months, maybe the next quarter. Uh, I'm expecting it to absolutely drop off a cliff, which a has big impacts on my income and my budget, um, but but mainly the wider economy, unemployment, you know, the high streets. Lots of stuff is this stuff has been rehearsed in in uh, other webinars and in the media, etc. So yeah, very very fearful about unemployment and the economy uh, in the future. And last but not least, Elva. Hi. Um, I think there's kind of a lot of touch points that we've already discussed here. Um, and I think the, the key thing is, I think at the moment, the need for flexibility has been put sharply in focus. I think we've all experienced over the last five to six weeks. Is it six weeks? I'm, I'm struggling to remember how long it's been now, but let's go six weeks. Um, how quickly our priorities change and how quickly markets change and, 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 and the economy and the pressures on the economy change. And I think what troubles me is how the planning system is is it can be difficult to react in such a way, um, and so it's kind of a a question for for us as an industry as to how can we help streamline the process and increase um, the ability for increased flexibility, so that not just in terms of how we work when suddenly the way we're used to working changes quite quickly, but also how we can plan and deliver places um, that can respond to market changes and to changes in what our, our societal pressures are quicker um, than is allowed in the, in the current kind of framework of our planning system. Thanks. Just having a quick look at the questions that have come through. Simon, I'm afraid there's the usual raft of questions that officials get with these things about, about timescales. So um, Matthew Nicholson, can, is there any way that you could, Simon, put a, put a timescale to extending permissions? Is it civil service, spring, summer or autumn? Um, similar question about the white paper from Hannah Langford. Well, it, is, that, is that likely to be, uh, to be published at, at, at what sort of time scale? And, and same from, from another uh, contributor as well. Could you, I wonder if you could say a little bit about those, those two. So, so this is always a, a question I get asked. And uh, I, you know, I'm always flattered that people think that I actually might know the answer to some of these questions. Uh, and, um, and that if I did, I'd be able to say, uh, say that and sort of say something new in public. I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed constitutionally to say anything interesting at uh, these sort of things. Um, so look, um, you know, uh, no is the answer on any of those. I can't say anything more than what, what I've said. We're on it. We know of the issues we're, we're working through lots of dependencies and so that's why i'm not going to give you any sort of precise dates at the moment um white paper you know there's a bit a really interesting question for this which is when we embarked on this journey the context was different and i think alice has encapsulated very importantly that some of the economic context could be really different different later in the year um really interesting question is what is the nature of the economic position we are working in you know what is the nature of the economies what has happened to some of our high streets to our town centers over the this period and you know picking up elvis uh, very sensible point about the responsiveness of planning actually that applies at the policy making level as well as the the, the practical level and i think it's a it, you know there's a bit of a difficult call which is when do we actually know what the medium term consequences of the situations we're in at the moment are and when, when are we in a position to work out what those are those are really big and interesting questions and i think um you know there is there is a possibility that we go back very quickly to the world that we uh, were in previously but there is a possibility that there are some real changes that have happened um, during this period and we I want to make sure that the policies we're introducing are responsive and reactive to the right type of economic point in the cycle rather than um, sort of the policies for a pre um, pre current world situation so that that's why I think there is actually a good uh, there, uh, as well as me being a usual bureaucrat and not able to answer any of those questions I think there's actually a good reason why ministers will want to keep um, a bit of the timetable a bit flexible to work out what they're responding to Thanks. That's that's as as ever a, ma a masterfully evasive, but a incredibly full answer. Th thank you, thank you, Simon. I'll um, take that. Absolutely, the way the way in which it's meant. Um, Mike, 
as as a as a, ma a you know major developer, arguably one of the, the well the major developer, how can we build in that flexibility in the short term that that means that you can continue to deliver? What 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 do we need? Um, yeah, I, I, th I think there's um, some of the themes that that Simon's um, already already talked already talked about. I I think the first um, is extensions to existing permissions. Um, and, and we think that should be for 12 months um, for permissions that have less than 12 months um, remaining. And we think that that's important because if permissions are, are lost, that will delay economic activity. Um, but some developers will be constrained by, by cost or time and those permissions um, may, may not be replaced. And I'll keep coming back to this point about cash flow. Um, Delaying implementation costs, which can mean design costs, just physical works to implement a permission rather than build it out, plus the SIL um, that is triggered on commencement can be significant. And if they can be redeployed, um, then we can get other developments moving. And I think the, the other point about extensions that we shouldn't lose sight of um, is, you know, as we keep saying, the world is going to look very different post-COVID and, and some of these permissions will have to change. And I think time to kind of contemplate and work up amendments, you know, for example, um, will, we, will we require the same amount of retail or the same amount of retail um, in a scheme that was permitted uh, three years ago? Um, perhaps not. So um, we think good reasons to um, extend planning permissions, particularly those with less than 12 months remaining. Um, also, um, flexibility around um, Section 106 and, and SIL. Um, and when we talk about Section 106 um, flexibility, I want to be clear that we're talking about rephasing, um, not renegotiating. Renegotiating. I think, you know, we realise the, the importance of delivering Section 106 obligations. Um, but what we are asking for is um, to, to look at some of the triggers for the financial contributions. Um, to help with cash flow and incentivize development. On, on SIL, we think the existing uh, instalment scheme um, could be used to defer um, some SIL costs um, by 12 months using an existing mechanism, or even to introduce additional later phases for much larger um, developments. And, and again, we think that will, um, if that was applied to developments which commenced in the next 12 months, um, that would incentivize development to come forward uh, earlier. And also, um, we think that government can encourage uh, local planning authorities to invest some of the unspent um, SIL money, um, which has already been collected uh, and um, is, is as yet unallocated to main fun maintain funding for uh, infrastructure in the short term um, to mitigate some of the impact of those, those deferrals. And, and my final point um, is just around um, making it easier to um, vary planning permissions. Yeah, I, th I think we're all conscious of the, um, the restrictions and the additional complexity introduced by um, recent Court of Appeal decision and a, a pragmatic uh, approach, and many authorities are doing this already, um, to the use of Section 96A to vary descriptions of development and Section 73 to um, vary permissions um, would, would be helpful and I think is, is essential to enable us to um, respond to those changing circumstances. Um, so that's, that's my, my four things, Gislaine. Simon, I see you nodding with that last, with that last one. Does, does, that, does that mean that's something that's, that's uh, making sense and, and might be under yeah. consideration? So it, it, it is making making sense. I sort of almost uh, I'm tempted to sort of ask, you know, because Alice is in term uh, is permanently wise on these things. So her views <laughs> on this, and that how how would um, what's the sort of flex that you'd actually like at a local level? Because I think there's a there's a little bit too much faith from a lot of people in the the importance of changing planning law and things, as opposed to actually dealing with the practicalities and engaging with the issues and the underlying uh, issues that local uh, local leaders, local officers have got to to deal with. And so um, 
I very, very much like Alice's view on what would practically help at the ground. I, I can see this, the need for a bit of flexibility on the, on the permissions. Um, there are tools which allow for variations of those, perhaps not as quick and perhaps not agile as they might be, but where the local authority is happy with that change, things can move pretty quickly at the moment. The question is often where the local authority is less, less happy, how do we do that? Um, and where they are less happy, you know, you can put um, a new legislative regime in around it, but actually what it will lead to is um, just a bit of challenging some of the, uh, as Alice was talking about, some of the, the local groups will be challenging bits of the process in there, and that doesn't necessarily give you an implementable consent. So I, I think it just needs a bit of thinking through for the next stages of those. And, uh, but it'd be good, you know, at, at the risk of passing the question on to my fellow panelists is, is sort of just see what, what would actually be helpful for somebody like Alice and the, uh, who's actually doing this in the real world. Fine, that's my cue Alice. to come in then, I think. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, well, those of you on the panel and who are watching who know me, I hope know that I am very flexible and very pragmatic because uh, I want to get development going. I, you know, that's that's what I'm in the job for, really. So I think anything that helps and recognising these strange times, then I think, yeah, should, we should be trying to do it. So with the with the extending planning permissions, I mean, we get requests for this anyway but particularly at the moment we're getting some in and there is this workaround but it is quite a complex workaround going through these mending two condition routes and which just makes you think this is silly there must be a better way but it is the only way at the moment but but we're generally pretty pragmatic about um about that and understanding the difficulties that applicants and developers are in at the moment but i would so i think whether we need national legislative change or we just carry on with the workaround that we've got at the moment for the interim, I expect the latter was, is probably the one that's going to prevail because I, don't, I wouldn't want a national change in legislation and, and then for it to continue really once we're out of this sort of lockdown because I, mean, I remember for a lot of my planning career and development management, uh, there was a five-year planning commission and the reason that was changed for three years was because the government were concerned that to, developers weren't getting on on site so they thought well let's make them do it quicker and everybody seems to have accepted that and I think I think that's something we still want to maintain in the system so I wouldn't I, I don't mind a temporary relaxation of the three-year uh, permission but um, and I think we can still do that if asked for it can we or we can do it shorter can we do it longer I don't even know um, but I think uh, you know I think it is a reasonable response to the current situation but not one I'd like to see embedded permanently. Thank you um, so just just let me think about the the, the uh, community part of this and, and the sort of third third party involvement. A lot of questions coming through around this. Elva, I wondered whether this was something that you'd done some thinking around around, around what this might mean for the future, um, and whether this this current engagement with communities is there's something we could learn from there. Yeah, we've been to be honest. I've been just on our general engagement as a, as an industry. I've been quite impressed by how quickly we've got up to speed in the last um, few weeks in relation to, we've had positive discussions with councils, we've had major applications submitted, we've had permissions um, at virtual planning committees. So things do, the, the kind of, the urge to get things moving as, um, get the show on the road, it seems to have, it, is working and let's hope that momentum continues. But we've also been doing some kind of a bit of a wider look at what this means in terms of general engagement for community engagement, but also looking forward in terms of inquiries and maybe local plan examination in the longer term. And the increased focus on remote engagement and, and how that could potentially not just, we've been looking at it from a, are we causing ourselves any issues in relation to inclusion and equality? But actually, I don't think this is necessarily just a negative thing. I think this could actually be a really positive thing. And we, you know, community engagement has been over the last few years trying to be a bit more um get capture a wider audience and with harder to reach groups and also just just a wider audience rather than those who show up to the drafty town halls on a saturday afternoon um and it's working but it's not really got as much traction as i would like and i think that this crisis may kick that into into gear and there should be there could be some really positive outcomes from it and actually increasing participation in planning issues from a wider section of society um, and not just from hard to reach groups but also just younger people people who are busy people who don't necessarily have um, the time to engage in in community consultation in the way that we currently do it so I think there could be some some really good positives coming out of this um, in terms of how we engage and how and how we um, can kind of speak to the community in relation to what planning issues mean to them. 
And is there a concern, just reach just one, another one of the questions from the audience, is there a concern that decisions undertaken at virtual committees might be subject to JR? Um, so it sounds like there's been, there's been some speculation around that. I don't know whether Simon, Alice, one of you wants to pick that one up. Shall I, shall I say something first, but then Alice can uh, probably follow up with the practicalities. So the key thing is that there is no principled reason why decisions um, made by um, virtual committees cannot be made by, uh, by uh, should be subject to judicial review. The, the legislation is, is quite clear on this. But as Alice said, the challenges, and this applies, and there's some questions about this on um, planning inspector and things. The question is less about the principle, but actually how do you do it in detail and the detailed practical arrangements for that and how do they they done in a way that gives fair and open access for relevant people to do it. And it is absolutely possible to do that. Our local authorities are coming up with that, but that just takes a little bit of thinking through. Um, it comes a little uh, crit a few little bits of procedural issues. How does the person facilitating the discussion bring in the right third parties give them the appropriate moments how do we just make sure that they're the they're, they're um they're, they've got the right documentation how is it just uh, is it managed which are deeply practical issues um and it, uh, you know just a, a sort of endorsement of what alice was saying about um some of the practical issues with getting virtual decision making there's some real real challenges for a number of local authorities who just don't have the tech at the standard and the, the robustness that is needed to be able to host this they are moving fast but if you, you know, those who'd invested in the tech over the last years are really reaping the benefit over there uh, at the moment those who haven't are having to move fast and catch up with some of that um and there are sort of you know what happens if your broadband drops out part way through and somebody can't can't uh, do that How, what do you have procedures and you just need to have, have bottomed out some of these issues uh, and i think it is a deep and practical thing we're working with the planning advisory service to get a sort of set of, quick, um, of frequently asked questions procedural guidance and support out there which i think is really important to get help local authorities um, but also to share some of the really good practice and that um, some authorities are going much better and greater than we would have ever thought of uh, in how they are uh, they are doing this there are challenges as alice says about this but i um I, I don't think that there is a legal risk to the principle of this. It will be just whether the precise procedures on any one case have been followed, observed, or are properly fair. Yes, uh, just Lane, if I could just come in on that as well. So I agree um, exactly with what Simon says about the risk of JR. Of course, I'm saying all of this in advance of our, our first real virtual planning committee, but our approach has been, we are having a normal planning committee. It's just gonna be online. So everything's the same. So objectors are going to get their three minutes. They have to give us 24 hour notice. We're asking them to send email in their statements if possible. So if they do drop out, the committee clerk can read the statement out. And hopefully by the time they come back in, they'll be in, in time for questions, etc. Same with the applicant. So all, all of those rules are the same. We haven't gone down the line of changing our delegated agreement personally. I'm not comfortable with that, nor is the council. We've discussed this. I've discussed it with the chief exec. Our view is that I changed you should have the right delegated agreement anyway. And I did quite a big piece of work when I started at Brent on making it what I thought was more suitable to enable committee to concentrate on big cases. I know some councils have gone that, down that line. I don't agree with it. The government have said, you can have your planning committees, you can do them online, and that's what we're gonna do. So we're taking the cases that previously we always thought should go to planning committee. We're still taking them to planning committee to have them debated and discussed in public. It's gonna be live streamed so people can still see what's going on. Um, so fingers crossed I, but the thing is kind of Simon alluded to this and it, we've seen it slightly in, even in this webinar zoom which we're using often cuts out for 10 or 20 seconds is that that's where the potential challenge might be because does that mean that the a member who was cut out then can't take part in the vote personally I think 20 or 20, 10 or 20 seconds you can deal with but if it's 30 seconds if it's a minute I, there, I did read about one council, one of the councils that's already done a virtual committee where it did drop out for one member and the chair excluded them from the vote, which was the right thing to do. It's like them leaving the committee chamber. It's like them leaving the room. But we shall see. Do tune in Wednesday next week at six o'clock. Alice, have you found the participation? Have you, what have your viewing numbers been like in relation to the virtual committee? committee <laughs> well we, we haven't had the virtual committee live streamed yet but we've been live streaming at we've been live streaming our committees anyway and uh let, let me tell you it's not a lot of competition for eastenders which okay. is at the same time <laughs> well, what can i say we've got we've got 200 in our audience today so you, you've got that to beat 
But, um, but it's a really good point that Elva, Elva's making. And, um, you know, there is some opportunity, and I think there is some work to be done on evaluating this, is that it is possible that virtual committees allow for broader participation mm -hmm. by different people and therefore offer some advantages. I share Alice's views that there are some downsides to this and we'll have to see what this is like when we're when we're able to meet physically again but this is a chance to do some innovation we don't do that much in planning uh, quite often it's a chance to do that we should learn from that work out what works well and we should see whether we are actually getting more popular engagement with this so uh, we're always concerned about what are the downsides but there may be some real upsides from this and I'm, I'm really keen to see what what those are and Alice do you have this sort of you know three your three top tips as it were for uh, applicants trying to engage with local authorities at, at this time? Um, I, well, I think the basic principles, you know, be collaborative, be polite, please don't be rude to your colleagues in local authority. Not many people are, but some people are. Um, so continue just with, you know, normal professional behaviour. I think give people a bit of slack. Um, I think that works both ways for us because none of us can do site visits. So, you know, if we need a bit of information from an applicant that needs a site visit, well, we might not get it. And likewise, if we can't do our site visit, so there has to be a delay, then so be it. Um, so it's a bit of just mutual understanding, I think, and patience. But, um, but you know, I don't know if... I don't know if people have to do that much, that much differently, to be honest. Re re reassuring to hear. Very, very reassuring. Um, so sort of look at, looking ahead a bit, I suppose, it sounds like there's an awful lot we can learn from certainly the, the, the way we're all engaging about how, how the planning system should work in the future. Are there other things that we should be thinking about? Are there, are there other things that we could be learning from this, this difficult time that we can, we can take? You know, plan, plan, the planning regime is archaic in many ways. And, <laughs> It's rather slow to, to move, Simon. You may you may disagree with me, um, but it would it would be you know if, if there are things people have been thinking about. I know Alice, you've got your your four R's um, that, yes. that you've been thinking about, and I, I wondered whether it would be good to say a few things about that. Oh, I'm going to have to name the four now, aren't I? So um, we are approaching coming out of this crisis, and are thinking across the council. This is based on four R's. So there is yes. So one is thinking about what we used to do that we've had to stop doing. Do we want to retire them or do we want to restore them? So for example, it might be planning committee. Do we just want to get it back in the council chamber? Um, uh, do, what do we want to retire? Uh, actually, that's been a bit harder to think about, but uh, yeah, and I won't go into that now actually. Um, but what do we want to reinvent? So some things around co uh, consultation. So we've, we now send our site notices to applicants to put up. Um, we might want to continue that actually why not uh, what do we say what and what do we want to restore what do we want to retire what do we want to reinvent and um, there's another R which I can't quite remember anyway we're using this framework to think about all the things that we've stopped doing all the things that we're doing differently uh, that we might want to continue and what are the things that we might want to sort of rip up and redo completely so for example this isn't really ripping it up, but our local plan is currently at examination stage. We're waiting for a date, obviously, and for the new arrangements to kick in or, or the lockdown to be lifted. Uh, but actually, do we need to go straight into a local plan review? A, because of the economic situation that we might find ourselves in. And B, do we need to approach things differently? You might want to come on to this later, but in a post-COVID or, or not post-COVID, because I don't think it's going to go away, is it? But do we need to really relook at our um, space standards for housing, about overcrowding in housing? We've all learned recently the importance of parks and open space. So do we have to have uh, some new thinking around how we actually plan our built environment? So, they, yeah, that's just a sort of flavour of the, the, what we're doing. We're looking at the operational things and a bit more of a long term about a economic recovery. Oh, which also, Simon... Use classes order. Please, please, please use this opportunity to relook at town centre uses and use classes order. So that's something that you can reinvent. We've consulted on one model of restructuring that. So I think that is something we definitely want to come back to. I think it is the question for me on that one is really um, sort of the town centre is moving almost faster than any model of thinking about the future of the use class and can or oh, classes order can can um, can keep up with and so there's a real sort of need for a bit of thinking about what is the most flexible model for the future that works that works really sensibly but manages that you know there's a reason why we ended up with a use classes order and what what is the what what 
is the balance we're going to strike in there? And that just, you know, if there's somebody who's got some sort of uh, long, uh, what's doing a bit of thinking about that, I think that's a really productive area to think about. Thank you. We've got a, a question from Dave Trimmingham. Um, we've had lots of analogies with, with wartime um, and as to, as to where we are now. And developments played a hugely positive role in, in that post-war recovery. Um, however, current public perception of development is very low. We, and we, at the BPF, we did a perception survey, perception audit last year, which, which proved this. Not only is, is their perceptions low, but also even understanding of who we are is, is very poor. Um, and so how can public and private sector work together to improve that perception? Um, and how, how, can we, how should we be working together to really make sure that we can, we can motor out of this? Michael, is this something you've been, you've been doing some thinking around? Um, yeah, we, we have. And, and before I go on to that, I just wanted to come back to a, a point from um, earlier in the discussion um, around workarounds, which are um, always hugely appreciated when um, planning authorities are pragmatic and work around. But I, I think what we really crave at the moment um, is some certainty uh, in, in an incredibly uncertain environment. Um, and I know there are, um, on, on extensions, for example, there are challenges fitting these things into the legislative programme. Um, but if that can be done, um, then that certainty um, helps us with um, uh, budget setting that we're doing. <coughs> Rather than having to hold all these costs in, in budgets, we can make investment decisions for the next 12 months, which is um, a process that we're going through. And, but to come back to your question, uh, Ghislaine, and, and look further ahead, um, I think you asked us to contemplate the, the next um, 10 years in, in the prep. I'm not sure I can, um, I can do that. I, um, I can maybe think about the next two years, although um, our, sen our, our sense is we, we will probably get a decade's worth of change um, in the next two years. So um, in some senses, maybe, maybe we are thinking 10 years ahead. Um, but Simon, you talked about um, increasing uh, land use flexibility and, and that we think is absolutely vital to keep pace and respond to changes and emerging trends. Um, and I get this is where I'm, I'm maybe going to be slightly braver um, in the discussion and just ask, um, you know, whether we should move to a, a much more permissive approach to land use. Um, so, for example, uh, for uh, the ground floor of an office building, um, why could that ground floor not be used for retail, leisure, workspace, education, healthcare, culture, or community, um, where all, all normal health and safety and environmental health standards um, are, are met? And we think, you know, that kind of flexibility will be hugely important um, going forward to be able to um, not just let space, but um, use space and respond to uh, the, the uh, enormous pace of change that we're going through. And, and we think that's particularly important for retail um, and in the town centre environment. And COVID-19 is, is going to have a lasting impact on our, our high street. Um, not all shops uh, are going to reopen. Um, and we are, we are going to be faced with um, retail uh, vacancies, just accelerating uh, trends which were already being driven by um, e-commerce. And landlords, developers, um, local government communities uh, are all going to um, have to work together and, and to be able to respond quickly to reinvigorate these places and, and repurpose um, a lot of existing retail um, so we think there is scope uh, for um, more permissive planning, for greater use of um, permitted development rights, and perhaps for concurrent uses um, to enable premises to be used much more flexibly. So for a, um, a, a co-working space or um, a shop during the day, um, but as uh, an events venue or a restaurant in, um, in the evening, um, to extend trading hours, drive um, footfall, and, and hopefully create you know, vibrant places during the day um, and the night. So we, we think um, I guess there's quite a lot there, but that, um, that land use uh, flexibility um, for me is the kind of the big change in, in planning, um, both structurally and, and culturally uh, that we'd like to see going forward. Mm -hmm. 
Many thanks. Just noticing a lot of questions coming up around local plans, not very surprisingly. Um, some questions around local plans that are currently in the process. Should they be delayed by the, uh, by the current circumstances? Should they be being amended uh, under the current circumstances? Or, or should we be carrying on life, life as normal? Um, Simon, I'm afraid that one's for you again. Yeah, well, it's sort of so. The, the short answer is no. We shouldn't be delaying on local plans. We just need to get get local plans in place, and it's really important that places get plans because they give the certainty and the clarity to investors. They give certainty and clarity to the communities, and I'm really keen that that we get there. And I haven't moved on uh, our ambition for getting plans in place everywhere and get plans which are kept up to date, which I think is the the big challenge these days. It's you know a few years ago when I first started looking at this, our problem was places. Which which didn't have a, a plan at all. I think the real issue now is plans which have uh, drifted out of date because they involve some difficult decisions. I don't think there's any reason to stop that. Look, I, I guess what I'm saying earlier about the planning inspector is it's really important that the planning inspector moves to a world where we can sort of conduct some of the hearings on this and so that we are able to carry on with that process. They are already doing um, uh, advisory visits um, uh, virtually uh, or actual meetings, but they're happening over, uh, digitally. I think it really needs to really needs to carry on getting done. Um, there is real opportunity to get different forms of engagement. So my, I am disinclined to advise anybody to slow down, um, uh, you know, detract from the work on um, on a local plan. There may be some specific reason where you actually some specific element of a plan where it feels like it's appropriate to to take a pause or do things. But plans are designed to set a framework for a period of time. They're not supposed to be wobbled by the current market circumstances you know if you um, get into a mess on the, the precise point in the economic cycle at every time where you're into it you, it's just not gonna uh, you're never gonna pick the the plan that works so I think it, it's my message would be get on with it on local plans I think it's uh, it's really important the only caveat at the margins is that I know that some local authorities are under real, real staffing pressures at the moment and uh, have had to move some of the staff into actually direct frontline COVID response issues, and yeah, that's that's a call which has to be made locally about relative prioritisation. Um, I'm the planning director. I, of course, would rather see them all uh, operating in planning, uh, and, and my my encouragement would be to get on with it on local plans. I think it's a really important part of, uh, part of the framework, and I think there is also actually to think a bit more imaginatively about how the consultation and engagement on those plans are done at this sort of time. Many thanks. Really, really clear steer. I'm just going to give you all a question's worth of notice that we're going to pick up on a question from Alex Green afterwards, which is, if you were all Secretary of State for the day, what would be the one major challenge that you would make if you could, if you could do anything you wanted to the planning system um, to help us over the next, the next few years? In the meantime, um, from Zach Simons, the planning inspectorate's latest position is that virtual events won't be fully up and running until six months after the May or July trials. And that's only a name and is only for most cases. Given the importance of, of all of this and to the delivery of large scale development, do the, do the panel have any view on that timeline? Um, I'm loath to, loath to ask Alice, Alice and Simon this. I'm going to send this off to Elva and Michael as to, as to what you feel about that timeline. Sorry, was this, was this in relation to all consultation? Because there's. Virtu uh, PINs virtual events. It's a question really that needs to be looked at in relation to the timeline of what the PINs events are coming up in the next few months, which I don't, I don't know offhand. Um, but I, I do think that the, the pins virtual events need to need to get going, and, they, and we need to make sure that the, there is a process to allow that to happen. Because particularly in relation to large infrastructure projects, you know, the government are not quite clear in terms of what the plans are um, for that. And and you know, this isn't just for pins, but also for DCO and, and inquiries and how they how they can be carried out progressively and positively going forward. And I, I was concentrating on what I'd do if I was uh, Secretary of State for the... <laughs> well, let's, let's move to that then, in, in which case I'm, I'm hoping you've got a good plan. <laughs> um, no, I, and I think, um, I think it'll uh, um, um, cover the point. Um, uh, well, um, what would I... I've just got myself in it, I realise. Um, what, would I, what would I do if I was um, uh, Secretary of State for the, um, for the day? Um, you know, I... I keep coming um, back to this point about um, uh, flexibility, um, but so that I, I don't sound like a complete broken um, record. You know, I, I think um, let's just let's just trial things. Um, you know, can we introduce some of these measures for temporary periods? Um, 
you know, flexible uses, um, a greater use of permissive development. You know, can we introduce it for, for two years um, to support the recovery um, and then review it? Um, you know, is it possible to, um, to pilot measures with uh, willing authorities in, uh, in specific opportunity areas? Um, so I, I guess just um, I would I, I be, be bold and I, I think the government is um, is being radical in many, many areas. But, um, you know, as a planning system, we, we can be quite slow to change. Um, so let, let's to kind of quote from government, use the regulatory uh, sandbox and, and just try stuff in different areas. Alice, I'm sure you've got ideas about what you'd like to do with your um, state. Yes, and Simon can probably predict what I'm going to say, actually, he's heard me on the soapbox before, but I think the context would be, I would make sure that the real purpose of planning is not forgotten, because one of the important things about planning is to support the economy and to be a contributor to, the, to growth and economic development, but that's not really the overall thing, which is much more about um, the quality of the environment and the social and environmental objectives that, that we have. Um, particularly social now, I, I think the planning system for thinking has moved quite a long way, actually going back to its origins, which is about physical and mental well-being, because it, it was originally introduced really as a public health measure, wasn't it? Anyway, um, so I'd, I'd want to keep that context so the, the social and environmental aspects aren't forgotten in the life to support the economy and have everything focused on viability but specifically when we're talking about physical physical and mental well-being and this is where Simon knows what I'm going to say I would reverse office to res residential permitted development and I would rip up the current proposals for demolition and rebuilding and two stories higher under permitted development because I'm so concerned about the standard of residential accommodation that is being provided in a lot of instances and we've seen from the last few months how absolutely fundamental it is for people to have decent quality of accommodation. Thank you, very, very clear. Elva, what would you, what would you do? I'm going to start here but I'd get rid of Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Kill Phil. But on a positive point, I think um, in relation to SIL, but also planning obligations um, and the kind of recent changes to the SIL regs uh, has resulted in a lot, kind of a, a reversion towards tariff-based approach for planning obligations. And in some cases, that's actually a good thing because it relates to, to developments and the, and the need for developments to mitigate their impacts. But on many local authorities I've, we've been looking at now where they have um, supplementary planning documents out for consultation, they're kind of it's just increasing the asks on development and it's not necessarily always very positive. And I think a question for Simon would be, is there an, any movement for the government to give a bit of positive support to a more positive direction in relation to SIL deferral payments over the next 12 months to local authorities? You, you alluded to in your introduction that there has been a patchy approach across across the across local authorities. I think local authorities need it. And I think just to, I know Michael talked about this in the intro as well, but the issue that we have at the moment, this economic crisis, it's a, it's a disruption to the supply chain. It's different to other economic crises we've had before. And development and development industry is a big employer and it has a big impact on the UK economy. So it's important to get that supply chain back up and running again. And it's not trying to get one over and try to save themselves some money. It's about retaining cash to try and get that wheel moving again, which will then come forward in time. And it's not about not paying so it's about deferring deferring payments to a later stage. And I was just wondering whether there is a any appetite to give local authorities a bit of a positive <coughs> Shall I, shall I do that, and then, uh, uh, and then I might have to duck your question about being Secretary of State. But, but actually, no, I'll have a go. Actually, um, so on. So, so that's why I was mentioning earlier that we've heard quite a lot about still deferral payments and uh, this this being a, a sensible way to look at. And, and if you look at what the government has done on some other tax liabilities, it has been talking about deferring taxes so it feels to me to be uh, not a million miles away from the sort of um, the, uh, the spirit of the way the government's been going so I think there's there's something in that it's not actually technically straightforward uh, in a in number of ways and th there are some sort of just issues and questions about there and the one I would want to be sure that I wasn't sort of um, damaging local government finances uh, because you know this is a bit of money uh, and important cash that comes into local government at a time when local government 
government finances are on uh, under stretch. So I can see the case for it, but I think there's a there's still a little bit of work uh, work in that space. So, um, but definitely hear what you say uh, say Elva on that. Apart from the bit about kill sill, which um, uh, I, 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 I'll uh, I'll listen and let go out through the, through yeah. the other part of the year. Um, in terms of you know what what if I was Secretary of State for the day? So. Um, what would I do? So I can't answer this one because I'm probably constitutionally uh, prohibited from doing so. And, uh, and but but it, it's a slightly sort of glib answer, but it's actually quite important which is to say I try not to do anything and imagine that I could change anything if I was in power for a day. You know, planning is a complicated system. You know, in a sense, I have listened very carefully to people across this industry for four years now, and my understanding is that. Um, is that it actually takes a while to change things and you've actually got to work with the people who are actually going to implement it. And the less successful changes tend to be ones which are dreamt up in Whitehall in a day and then waved through and implemented. And actually, if we're going to really implement and drive through change that work, really works, it's got to be done in a much more participative, involving way, um, possibly based as much so as about sort of innovation and experimentation rather than sort of um, me and the Secretary of State locked in a room and coming up with a, a, a cunning wheeze. So you know, it's it's a sort of non-answer, but I think it's actually true with something as complicated and difficult as planning that actually it's probably a benefit not from having uh, sort of um, uh, me being in charge for a day and making a whole load of changes. Masterful answer, Simon, if I, if I may say so. I'm sure the Secretary of State would be delighted to, to hear that. Um, so on, on that note, I'm going to draw this, this webinar to a close. Thank you all ever so much. Um, for those watching, we have many, many more up our sleeve coming up. We have a, an exciting partnership with the UK PropTech Association, which will be holding our second event next week on PropTech and COVID-19, surviving or thriving. And then we are for the first time bringing together all the chief execs of the various REIT organizations across the world next Thursday to talk about the global experiences of um, COVID-19 and, and where that, where that stands us. And that will be chaired by Damien Wilde. So many thanks all.